What's going on guys? My name is Jack and welcome back to a brand new video. Today we are going to be breaking down what makes T1 for my money the best Valorant team in the world. So with one of the first as close as we can get major Valorant tournaments out of the way being the Twitch Rivals Valorant launch showdown in the books, T1 took home the victory in the North American bracket going 5-0 and led by the expert leadership of Brax, they are shaping him to be currently the best team Valorant has in its pro circuit. Obviously, it's a little hard to gauge that currently with the current state of the world. There are probably not going to be any LAN tournaments for a good while, and we really don't even know how far Riot's going to take their support of Valorant at its current point. But analysis still needs to happen. I think it's very important to take a look at what the pro players are doing, as some of this could be used in your own game. So, in the final, we saw Brax take on Myth and the TSM squad in a best of three set. And in map one, we saw them play Bind. And I really enjoyed a lot of the strats I saw pulled out on the T1 side. Now, for their credit, Myth and the TSM squad did very well themselves, but we're focusing our attention on what Braxton and T1 were doing in this video. So before we hop into Valorant itself and break down a little more in depth of what we're seeing, we're first going to watch a couple of rounds. We're going to start here after the pistol win for T1. This is their first round defending against an anti-eco. They're going to be holding off the TSM squadron with basically no money, just trying to get through to the next round. But we start to see some things here from the T1 defense that are going to be pivotal throughout this entire half. Bind being a very defensive side of map to begin with, depending on how you like to play map control, it's really interesting to see how T1 are choosing to hold on some of these bomb sites that can be quite hard to hold in the right situations. So let's go ahead and watch it on the round. And uh, just for some clarity, I'm going to be keeping the stream VOD muted just because I don't want what I am saying to override what the casters are saying. I would recommend hunting down these VODs and watching them yourselves if you want the commentary. It was quite good. It was done by DDK. Uh, Golden Boy and a third man whose name escapes me currently, but I'll flash it on screen right now. Anyway, let's go ahead and watch the round. So as you can see here, uh, the T1 side is not going to be buying up too much. We see a couple of Spectres, a couple of Ghosts. We see good utility being brought out. We see one Bulldog on AZK, that's for the B bomb site. But we're focusing our attention here on the A bomb site because I find that in standard play, most people are going to be putting A on the or three on the A bomb site and two on the B bomb site. But T1 pretty much throughout this entire half play 3B, 2A. It's because of this setup with Brax and Crashies with the Cypher and the Raze counterplay. Now, obviously, this being a VOD, I can't switch around the viewpoints myself. We have to deal with what the stream was doing. But you can see it on the main map here in the top left, and we'll go in game here in a second. We see Cypher traps on Showers and Short. We see a camera inside of Showers, and we see Brax and Hoy inside of U Haul with Crashies playing by the A default. So Brax gets first contact there by the teleporter, backs him off with his bombs. You see Crashy's support by default with the cage and the trap being triggered. And now it's a 3v5, no money on the myth side. What are they even going to do here? We're pretty much just waiting on this round to conclude. But these defensive pillars are going to be consistent throughout most of the half. So we see Crashy's perspective here moving through the U-Haul, spots with his camera and showers to make sure it's clear. Begins to clear the U-Haul corners, pushing up to get more intel. Brax pushes in the showers to clear that fully. We have Breach in Heaven. I believe that is AZK. And here we go. Double kill to end the round. AZK with the third. And there you go. So we're going to pause here and we're going to jump in game. I want to focus on Crashy and the Cypher placement here. Because this is what is enabling the two players on the A bomb site to be able to hold it. So from what I noticed watching this uh, VOD on Bind, we saw Crashy's use two main camera spots. It was either right here about there on heaven to watch short or what we were seeing here oh gotta end the game phase we were watching crashies throw one of his traps here that was a misclick we we're watching crashy throw one of his traps here a cage in the doorway and then he would throw his camera right about here i think actually more in here they didn't show exactly where the camera placement is so i'm just kind of making them as i go so yeah right about here in this corner just so the Crashies could play from this default position here. He could play from back here to Jiggle Peak Short. He could play from back here to also hold an angle on the short, peek into showers. He could also just quickly check his camera for the showers and then obviously be able to hold short with Brax inside of U-Haul. And this was the other main thing that they that Crashies would do pretty much every single round in this half. Is a tripwire right about here 
with a cage right on top of it. And what he'd be playing for is either the intel call from Brax inside a U-Hole. If players tried to jump over the trap, they would obviously make a sound cue, crash, uh, the cage would go up. Or they would trip the trip wire, and then the cage would go up regardless. And this would allow Brax to swing out right here pretty confident that you got players here. Clear this corner, clear here, maybe get a little aggressive and clear here if he's feeling crazy. Throw out his boom bot to clear this hallway. And now essentially what they've done is opened up with the use of Cypher's Utility acting as the third man on the A-bomb site. We were able to see that they were able to stack Brimstone, Breach, and Sage onto B to really lock down those positions of Hookah and B-long. Which with two people can get kind of hard if you have the full team rushing you. That can be quite hard to hold without the proper utility usage. So we saw this from T1 and pretty much every single defensive round was a similar setup to this from Crash. He's just varying up the Cypher Camp placement. I found it very interesting that this essentially just opened up their team composition a lot more. AZK could play this sort of uh, Lurk position. Or Lurk's not the right word, but a rotator role where he could play either A or B as needed. And obviously Breach Kit facilitates either taking forward position or playing support and retake with his flashbangs, the ground slam, and the uh, bomb. So I found that to be very interesting. Let's go back and let's watch our next round to see what else I saw the T1 were doing in this bind game. So we're actually going to be jumping into the very next round here uh, after their first two wins coming off of the pistol. Uh, the T1 side begin their first defense against a full bot TSM. And what's very interesting here is that T1 actually makes, in my opinion, a very serious error in this round. And that they very early on kind of disrupt their setup with the three towards the B side, two towards A. And they opt to actually have AZK, as we'll see, play from the heaven position on A for pretty much the entirety of the round. And we're going to see that TSM actually uses this, well, unknowingly to their advantage to pull off a very nice fake towards the A bomb site and set up for a slow push B. And this is where, after this round, T1 are going to have to essentially respond to the fact that they're currently playing a very passive playstyle. And normally passive on bind is very good, but I think an error that T1 ran into here was that they didn't have any forward control towards the hookah position. And what I mean by that is... Oh, hold on, we'll just go ahead and... We'll ghost over to B. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, low glitchy. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're good. So, it is no big deal to have two people playing on the B bomb side. I feel like in most standard games, you end up with 3A, 2B. But, I think something that's very important is while you necessarily don't have to dedicate forward utility to this hookah entrance, uh, what you want to do, at least in my opinion, is at the beginning of the round, have some information scouting, a little jiggle peek. We'll just see if you can get an idea of if they're going to be going B fast. In general, I think giving up hookah entirely can be kind of a grave error because essentially you're throwing it down to very hard situations if you're going to defend here from the cubby. Because, you know, let's say you're playing with a Phantom, right? And when you're dealing with players who are peeking uh, from this far back hookah position, this is a very tight head glitch to deal with. And when you consider that the background here is actually dark, it can be quite hard to see certain player models' heads, even with the red outline. However, you stand out like a sore thumb against this bright background. This is very defensively favored, as well as you kind of get the peeker's advantage on a head glitch position. This position here can be very easy for a defender to take that shot and get that kill. Obviously, you can jump on the box here, clear this, get up in the corner, clear elbow, and then suddenly your B-side's blown open. T1 do actually run into this problem, I think. And a big issue is they don't have the third person B to kind of offset these very offensively favored 1v1 positions. So we're going to go ahead and watch how this round plays out. So let's take note again, we have the standard Cypher Utility on A, but no camera. I couldn't actually find where he put his camera or if he saved it this round, I think he ended up saving it. But let's watch what TSM do right away. TSM start off this round with a double smoke on A to, bro to block off the default and on top of U-Haul. And they Molotov towards U-Haul itself. And what they've done here is they've put TS or T1 on edge. You see Crash is going to activate his trap early with no spot. Um, TSM are actually going to jiggle into that to give uh, Crashy some sound cues to kind of fuck with him a little bit. And what they've done here is uh, T1 are on alert for an A push now. You have AZK stuck in heaven, you have Brax and Crash, he's holding hard towards short position, and now TSM are able to slowly rotate back towards B. We see we have two coming towards Hookah, Oma coming behind late. We have Wardell and the Sage going long with the op support. And now it's just two people on the B bomb site against the world. 
And this is where those very offensive favored 1v1s come into play. Even with the Brimstone delays and the Sage delays from the Smoke of the Slow Orbs, look how out of position T1 are because they were put on high alert for an A push. Omen Smoke, CT, that's the clue that you're going to get a B push. AZK is hauling ass back to the B bomb site. But it's going to be too little too late, even with the stalling from Sage. They're going to push out here. Sage hops over her wall and they start taking their fights. And look, this right here. Hold on. Look at this picture. Look how bad this is for T1. Uh, food here in the B-bomb site is now one man alone to save the country he loves. Sage, Ace, or, uh, Skadoodle is blocked off an elbow. You have Wardell peeking over a Sage wall from long. You have two in Hookah. And presumably they have the sound cue that there's one on the bomb site because Sage jumped over. This is a terrible position for T1 to be in. And this is where that misplay of getting too antsy to switch up. If they had a third person here, this round goes very different. So we're going to watch this play out. It goes exactly how you expect. There's a couple of trades here. Uh, AZK picks one from Hookah. Color picks food on site. Drone uh, refrags onto AZK. we got Wardell in a power position with the odd Sage on top of the bomb site. And at this point, the round's over. Even though there's 13 seconds left, they're just getting the bomb down. This It's unwinnable at this point. 4v1. Brax goes down to Wardell's op. We got a re-smoke the CT from the Omen, and Crashies is just done. There's no way you're getting through at this point. So now we have to watch what T1 do on the round following this, because they now have to respond to the fact that they essentially gave up too much map control and gave the B-bomb site for free. So let's go ahead and skip to the next round. So here we are. Brax and T1 just lost a round very hard, in my opinion. I think that they made uh, quite a big error in how they chose to compose the defense on this first gun round and now is their chance to sort of push back and not allow tsm to establish control and i want to say going into this round I actually don't disagree with what tsm does here they just kind of fall to um well crash he's just going off it's kind of what's going to happen here but the composition of t1 is actually much better set up in my opinion to handle what is going to happen so we're gonna go ahead and let the, the round play out okay please unpause thank you oh gotta mute it my bad all right, so if we uh, look over on the main map here, we're going to pause for a second. As you can see, there's a little bit of deliberation. AZK float around CT for a second. There's about nine seconds left in the warm-up. But Brax and T1 have decided, yeah, okay, we need to put 3B. We need to establish some control. And what's very nice here is what I alluded to is exactly what they end up doing. A little bit of uh, foreshadowing for you. They are actually going to aggress into Hookah early on in the round for the intelligence. They're not necessarily, not necessarily looking to fight, but they're looking to establish the map control so they can rotate more freely. As you see here, we have Skadoodle and AZK inside of Hookah. We had a smash towards Long, and now they're just going to hold this. They now have this intel that, okay, nothing's happening right away. And as you can see here, TSM decided to go up fast shorts. They try to switch up the momentum. They try to not let T1 get too established in what they're doing. They went hard B last time, or they went uh, a fake A, slow B. Now they're going to go for a hard A. There's actually, in my opinion, a good switch up from TSM, but they kind of fall to the fact that this composition on A with Crashies and Brax is incredibly strong. This Sage Raise combo is incredible for how tight the choke points are going into Bind's A site. As you can see here, what happens here, uh, Drone just gets unfortunated, unfortunately. So we're going to go ahead and cut over to him. And we get smokes early towards the U-Haul. We get Crashy pops his cage. And I believe what happens here, and they comment on this in the commentators, we don't hear the sound cue, so it's kind of hard to tell. But either Crashy is just pre-firing this, or Drone accidentally nicked the edge of the Cypher cage and gave the sound cue to Crashy, who starts spamming it either way. This round does go differently if Crashies doesn't get this kill and gets this intel, but this is the game we play. This happens in CS, this happens in Valorant. Sometimes you get very lucky, and luck is something that you need sometimes. So Crashies gets this kill through the cage, through the smokes. Drone goes down early, and that's huge. Now T now T1 have momentum. As you can see here, we have one towards B long for TSM, you have two towards showers, and then you have their brimstone kind of just all alone. All by his lonesome over the short A with the bomb down in the market area. And again, this setup from TSM is really good. Leaving the bomb here in the central location is very smart because their Sage can essentially back off, get the bomb, come A if they get it, or they can rotate off and go B. So again, I don't disagree with what they chose to do here. They just get out executed. As you can see, T1 are still holding with their 3B2A despite the pick, but they're gonna start rotating. And then what plays out from here is just good plays from Crashy. He just starts to use his utility very well. He has the camera up. 
He's watching, he's watching. Oh, Brimstone gets caught out. He's marked now. Brimstone's stuck in the cubby. He's absolutely destroyed. What's he gonna do? Brax is gonna chuck in one of them grenades. As you can see here, Brax with the grenade. He gets Omen stunned, so he backs off the position in case someone pushes up Hookah. As you can see, three TSM players in short. Crashies picks up the frag on Sabrosa, who has been marked out, pushed out of cubby. And now this round is essentially just broken open. As you can see here, there's only one person left on B. Look at this. Look at this setup from T1. 4A as the over rotate so they can really overwhelm the bomb site and not allow them to take control. But obviously TSM at this point, they're not going to be pushing. They're like, nah, I'm good, dude. I I'm out. I'm going to hop out of here. I'm going to go to the other bomb site. And despite that, this is where I think the brilliant decision to leave AZK and Hookah really pays off. He is hearing these rotates. He is hearing Jet hauling ass. Or at least he can make the guess. Jet's going to get about right here. Maybe he'll hear the sound cue. But he can assume maybe there's one still on. Maybe there's still one pushing towards the bomb site. Maybe they're going to rotate B. However, they kept him there just to prevent that and keep an eye on it. And AZK is going to stay in Hookah the entire round. So we're going to let this play out. Wardell is watching for a pinch just by his teammate being up long just in case someone pushed through Hookah. Obviously those things can happen. As you can see... We have the Sage moving out onto the B-bomb site. He's going to schlep into, into Elbow before Brimstone can get back. Color's going to get behind him. And uh, obviously we don't get to see this, but I'm kind of curious how this happens. I'll point it out when it happens. But they do get a sound cue that Color is in back halls. And I'm not really sure how. I'm not really sure where they get that. I'm assuming it was just someone spotted it. Oh, it's right here. I totally missed this, actually. I missed that Color killed Skadoodle. I, I, I'm, I'm, good at, I'm a good analyst, I swear. So now they got the intel. Color is deep in back halls. You have two on the A-bomb site, and you have Food and AZK holding the B-bomb site. Food is over here by the tube. You got AZK inside of Hookah, and you got Myth and Wardell pushing up into Hookah to try and take this control and take the bomb site. So at this point, Brax and Crashy are going to haul ass back to the bomb site to try and help the retake efforts, because they're assuming that the site could be lost here. It's very possible. It's a 2v3. It depends on how the 1v1s go. But they actually go in their favor. Food's going to turn around here. We don't get to see it, but just absolutely destroy Cutler on the refrag, which is great. And again, right here, TSM make the proper call. They pinch at the same time. Cutler pushes out as they push in. This is great. This should have worked out for them. But T1's execution and their 1v1s in this round were just better. AZK, despite being caught out, he momentarily flinches towards the person in CT back halls and that gives time for TSM to push into hookah but then he just snap backs and one hits uh Wardell with that phantom because obviously inside of a certain range phantom will one shot headshot full armor and he manages to get the one tap off and trade where it should have been a free kill for TSM and they should have been 2v1 in food on the bomb site instead of it's a 1v1 and myth now just has to save the op so again They've done something very smart here in this sort of clapback gun round where they pushed TSM back and said, no, you can't have the momentum here. You can't have the map control. And it all started with this push up into Hookah on the B-bomb site to get that intelligence early on in the round and some just some great play from Crashies and Brax on the A-bomb site. So uh, quickly, we are actually going to be skipping ahead further into the match here just to get some more key things to break down. I just want to point out one other thing that T1 did during this um, defensive half that I really enjoyed, and that was their team play around ultimates. So watch how this round plays out here. Also want to point out here, uh, if we back it up just a little bit, that uh, this camera spot from Crash he seems to be his third variation. We've seen now three cameras put it here into the short cubby. Actually, very smart camera location, very sneaky. But uh, watch how this round plays out. So... TSM are going to be pushing up for the short A control. They heard the camera go up, so they know it's somewhere in this cubby. They're not exactly sure where. Drone is going to push forward. He is going to proc the Cypher camera as the smokes come out. He's going to get caught up, and then his ult is going to get deleted. And then watch, look at this combo. As soon as Crashies calls out, hey, they are in my Cypher cage. Look at where... Okay, right here. Look at where Brimstone is on the map. Brimstone is over here on the B-bomb site. He is able to still land his ultimate into the short A cubby from B site to support the A players. This is a spectacular combo from T1. Not only did they frag 
the uh, Phoenix Ultimate, they then immediately kill Phoenix out of his ultimate because he's caught in the Hellfire. It's great. It forces out a res from TSM early into the round to try and keep it odds at a 5v5. Uh, this round is a point up very standard after the fact, but I really enjoyed this. This is just something that you should always consider when you're uh, playing with your teammates. And even if you're pre-made or you're playing with randoms, this kind of communication can be very key. Because as you get to the higher levels of play, people are going to be more aware of how to use this utility. So if we just kind of look a little bit at how this round played out. I'm going to grab my camera and show you that camera location as well. So... Being in the round, we had Crashy go over here, toss up his camera into this corner, his little sneaky camera. Backs off. He's in waiting. He's playing for intel, playing for intel. TSM are creeping up short A here. And then we get this interaction where the Omen and the Brimstone Smokes will go down, uh, like, like right here. So they throw this smoke setup, and that causes this reaction from Crashy, where he immediately pops this cage. As Phoenix pops his ultimate, walks in, gets hit by the trap, he gets tapped through by Brags or Crashies, and instantly we see the Brimstone ultimate cover up this area. This is just doing my best here without switching characters. Brimstone ultimate covers up this area and shuts down the A rush before it can even get uh, started, and it just ruins TSM on this attack. Alright, we're gonna skip further on to the match. Alright, so we're actually skipping pretty far ahead into the game at this point. We're getting near the end of the defensive half for T1. And uh, mostly the rounds have played out very standard. Not a whole lot of really different strategies than what I've already highlighted have been used. It's mostly kind of come down to um, interaction and individual gunfights. Which, uh, really, there's not a whole lot to go over there. It's just trading and duels and positioning. I wanted to focus more on the strats and the ability usage. Stuff that you can um, realistically apply to your game because... For most people, the individual skill on display here is just much higher than what we personally have. So, not going to focus on the individual highlights too much here. So we're in uh, round number 12. Or, I'm sorry, round number 11. Because I can count. I'm an, I'm an adult human who can count. Round number 11. And we are deep into the round at this point. T1 got their first pick on the Phoenix over at the short A position. And now TSM are pivoting to a B push. As you can see here on the mini-map, we have AZK in back sight. We have Skadoodle and Food pushed up into the garden room on long B. And we have a Skadoodle wall going up as a Hellfire is deployed into Hookah. So, let's get into what's going on here. We're going to see Wardell go right over the stage wall. We are going to see trades from Sabrosa and Wardell for sight control onto Skadoodle and Food. It is now, at this point, with Myth getting picked, it is a 2v3. We have AZK, Brax, and Crashies versus Wardell and Cutler. So, let's see how this plays out. <clears throat> the spike goes down. We have some Omen Smokes. We still have AZK in the backside. Brax coming up to CT back halls. And Crashies coming through CT spawn slowly. As you can see here, we the TSM isolate where... AZK is, frag him out, trade it on his wall. Wardell is able to plant the bomb in what I would call the default plant position. Brax flying over with his ultimate here. Now this was unfortunate for good old Braxton Pierce. His ultimate should have killed Wardell, but leaves him with a tiny, itty bitty little, little bit of health. So, the bomb goes down. Brax's attempt to frag the bomb carrier fails they know where he was planting it was a good choice by brax just splash damage can be a little finicky and now as you can see we have brax and crashies out on the site with wardell on one health and cutler back towards the long garden area oh i need to mute this all right anyway brax is gonna toss his grenade gonna throw his bomb pack crash is gonna get the frag on wardell and now it's 1v2 and what i want to highlight right here Pause the fucking... God damn it. Oh, okay, hold on. Right here. This is what I want to highlight. Crashies has not used ultimate at all on this half. And Cypher ultimates can be kind of hard to use. So, now they have an idea where Cutler could be. They have a rough idea. He could be Hookah or he could be Long. They don't think he's in an elbow. But that's just a guess, right? So now that they have the Wardell kill and they seem to have control of the site up towards the bomb... Crashy is going to take this opportunity and use his ultimate to secure the 2v1. 
So Crash is in a position where he needs to just use his ultimate to secure this round because there's not really much of a better place to use it. This is kind of the one problem with Cypher's ultimate. Is it could be, it could feel like it's very hard to find a position where it's worth using. But right here is perfect. You may think, oh, but there's only one person left. What's the point? So while most people might jump at the conclusion that you should only, that using your ultimate to get the one kill is not as valuable as maybe using it in a different round, you have to consider opportunity cost as well as the fact that we're deep into the half. You really want to use it and not lose it, and Crash is just running out of opportunities to feasibly use his ultimate in a viable situation. Using it right here locks down the 2v1 and gives them the round. So it's actually quite high opportunity cost for him to go ahead and use it here as we see. This round plays out, Crash, he tosses out his ultimate onto Wardell's body, and they get the ID that color is in fact on long. And now it's just easy. Brax gets the kill, because Brax is opting like a fool, and there you go. So, we end the defensive house for T1, them going up with a heavy lead, 10-2, going into the attacking half. It's looking very good for T1 here, they're in a position where it would be very hard for them to lose, but... If you ever played any games like this, then you know that, well, it's never really guaranteed until the last round's on the board. I want to highlight real quick the buy going into the pistol round on both sides. We saw four ghosts from each team, exactly four ghosts, with one character choosing to run classic and utility. That's actually both uh, both team sage picks are running classic and utility. And we see varying amounts of utility and ghosts bought up on the remaining players. Now, um, armor is not an uncommon sight, it would seem, in uh, the pro-level matches. Certainly in matchmaking, you're going to see a lot of armor classic. Uh, it kind of goes back and forth. Uh, I personally also go back and forth in my own games, which you can find over on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash lionhearts1337. You know, link in the description, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, um, the, the longevity of the classic and light armor is great. There's no denying that. But the classic as a pistol is all around unreliable, and that's why people tend to go for the ghost as the preferred pick. I um, just want to highlight the buy here. Let's go ahead and talk about what's actually going to be happening as far as the pistol strap. Alright, so firstly, as usual, we're going to highlight where the teams have positioned. And as you can see, TSM, because they're on the back foot here, they do actually have to get pretty brave with their pistol strats here on the defensive side. They need to establish control early if they want a chance to be in this game. And as you can see, their uh, choice in that matter is to send three out long B and one person into hookah. And that is to shut down any chance of a B take by T1. And obviously B, in most people's opinion, is the easier of the two sites to attack on bind. So if you can shut that down early and tell T1 to say to go fuck themselves, then yeah, you kind of may you may put fear in them for the rest of the half as to what you're doing on that B side, and it may put them on the back foot and force them to play more passive. At least that's my interpretation of what they're trying to do. And as you can see here, T1 were indeed probably leaning on some kind of B push here. We have four people stacked into the market entrance, ready to go. Hookah, you have Cypher towards Showers, which is actually our hint that maybe they're trying to play some kind of fake or a rotate strat or a slow strat. So let's go ahead and see how it plays out. So as you can see here, they're getting ready to push out. They're getting uh, TSM is also getting ready to push. It's gonna be could be a fucking huge conflict right here. Doesn't really play out that way. We can see food heading out towards long. We have the three people pushing up the market area, just kind of seeing what's going on. You know, just kind of feeling out a little bit. We get kind of a little bit of contact. We get a sighting on the sage here, and they're like, "Yeah, nah, not really feeling this. This B push might be a little tough." So T1 backs out and starts rotating towards A. And as and even though this is a highlight of what T1 are doing, I do want to take a moment to point out that I think Sabrosa on the TSM side plays this pistol round immaculately. Spots the intel with the jump peak, puts out the smoke, and look at look at this Molotov right here. This is perfect. As you can see, T1 are about to funnel down short. And he's going to bank this Molotov just in front of his smoke after he gets the cue from the breach that they're going. And look, they run through his smoke into his Molotov. This is brilliant. This is so well done from Sabrosa. This guts their push entirely. And this basically wins the round for TSM. Again, I'm talking about T1 strats specifically here. But it's worth highlighting that I think Sabrosa did an amazing job by himself here to hold the A site while his teammates rotated. Just want to throw it out for all of your Brimstone players out there. That Molotov is very good and you should learn it. And TSM do in fact take the pistol round. So now we're going to highlight what Team 1 do on the clapback, on their eco round. Do they make something work? Because the rounds are so, the game is so close at this point that any momentum T1 gets 
could just win the game flat out. Alright, so here we are. This is the round after the second half. Pistol. T1 are full saving. Some investment from the players who got kills during the pistol round. We have two ghosts on the field, I believe. Uh, we actually don't get a shot of the scoreboard. I do know that AZK has a ghost, and there might be one other on the field. And they are going against a mostly full bot TSM. There's two Spectres, two Phantoms, and then Wardell is pistoling to get to the uh, operator as fast as possible. Makes sense. And uh, something minor just note on the TSM side, they're also doing 2A, 3B currently. Though I think their team composition is team composition is less intuitively set up for that. Cypher facilitates solo holds a lot better in my opinion. But it's also their anti-eco rounds. So maybe they're not anticipating to need as much help on the A-bomb side as they might need in later rounds. And as we see, the strat here from T1 isn't going to be overly sophisticated. But it's the execution, a little bit of opportunity, a little bit of luck that puts them into a much more positive position. So let's see how it plays out. All right, fat hands to the rescue. I um, hit my spacebar to unpause the old uh, Twitch VOD here, and um, turns out I had pressed into my OBS, and that uh, stopped my recording. So here we are. Let's see how it plays out. So obviously, here we are. We have four people towards the market door once again. We have Wardell for TSM. We have Wardell for TSM towards the hookah entrance. Going to get an info play here. He's going to knife peek it, and then we have Myth and um drone towards the uh flower side of long b gonna also push out for some intel probably so let's see how it pays out wardell with the little jump peak the intel sees people there he's gonna call hey guys we got the ego players over here and let's see what goes on from here a little bit of contact a little bit of utility traded azk with the smash to the wall and now how it goes up goes on here just like you get a uh, the stone from the omen here actually i want to point this out i think this is very key Myth, I think, fires a little early on his stun. The pushback from the Phoenix fire was enough that I think they should have been aware of the possibility of a rotate and that they wouldn't just forehead straight through Hookah like that. I think that this round plays out much differently had Myth held on to his paranoia a little bit longer and it might have changed the entire flow of the round. I just want to point that out. So here we go. They're not actually going to end up pushing through Hookah. They're actually going to turn around all four players you have Crash, he's getting the intel towards A, saying, hey, the A guys are still here. And they're going to start working their way up long and try and take a contact play here. We have, well, this will be the last time we pause for this round, probably. We have Drone into Hookah. We have Wardell playing on top of the tube. And then we have Omen, who is Myth, in Elbow. So let's see what happens. So as you see here, contact play on Wardell. They're jiggle peeing to get the intel, trade pistol shots. Wardell, I, for the record, I think what Wardell does on this round is fine just buying a pistol. They don't really anticipate this round being very difficult because of the fact that you're dealing with players with mainly classics. However, if your pistol play is a little shoddy in that round, a little, sh a little not too shabby, you know, a little suspect, then this one player not having a submachine gun could suddenly become a glaring weakness in the defense. This is the drawback of trying to get the operator in Wardell's hands as fast as possible. And I think that plays out in this round. As you can see, they push up, they push up, they're contacting, they're out on site, and then the, the picks just go their way, right? This just goes so well. Skadoodle pops off with the classic. They trade with Drone immediately in Hookah, and then Myth does get two players, but then Skadoodle just double taps him, double taps Wardell. Wardell just gets screwed, just gets absolutely destroyed. And look at this. Three T1 players alive with the bomb site. They have two Spectres now. Or I don't think they actually get the third Spectre because uh, Crash is going to die here. He's going to trade out, I believe. But this position went from an eco save round just trying to get a bomb plant to where T1 now are in serious contention to win the round. So they pick up the weapons. Spectre on Skadoodle. Skadoodle has 10 health. And then this call from Brax. This mid ground call is fantastic. They know they're going to be hard rotating. Cutler just traded out Crash who killed Sabrosa. Now it's a 2v1. They know where Cutler is. And Brax is instant, and this is just great teamwork right here. Skadoodle stops the plant, he's listening to his teammate, and they're like, yeah, let's go teleporter, let's go A. This is absolutely the best call they've made in this entire game. Because look, Color's like, fuck, they rotated, what am I going to do? Have to trundle through CT, they're going to get the bomb site. Also, another great move, Skadoodle dropping the gun to Brax, who's full health. Great, great awareness there from Skadoodle. And this plays out how you would expect. They get the bomb down, they plant for short. It's very safe. They double up into Hookah, and Color is just in a disadvantageous position 100%. What's he going to be able to do here? He's taking so much time that even Skadoodle is able to actually get a heal off, I believe. 
Yeah. So Skadoodle heals. You know, I have two full health players, no armor against one player with armor and a specter. And this is not in color's favor. He does a very good job of nearly winning the round here. Safely rotating around, clearing hookah. He puts himself into 1v1s. This is a smart decision here. Right here, nearly kills Skadoodle. If that kill happens, I think he wins the round. And right here, could have killed Brax, but Brax is just sneaky. Look, look at how slippery Brax is, dude. Like a fucking fish. Like a salmon swimming upstream here. Brax just slithers and slathers his way out of this kill loose. Boom, he's gone. Can't hit him. You can't touch him, dude. He's fucking... He's out middle through Ivy like a speed demon. And then you can't touch him. And then Brax goes over the top of the wall. And they went around. They had no business winning. This was just smart calling from T1 the entire way. And then just great pistol play from Skadoodle. And then that mid-ground call to go A just wins it for him. And now the momentum is massively in their favor. Alright, so here we go. Match point. T1 are looking very good. Lots of momentum going into this round. And I just gotta say before we watch how this plays out that... Um, man, this strat is so good. But as you'll see, you can run a perfect strat and in the end, still get robbed. So let's take a look at what happens. So we see the same thing from T1 here. Oh, actually they switched up. My bad. They are going to be focusing more towards the short A position. They're actually going to move quite fast. And this is a little bit of a foresighted decision here. I don't know if they were aware of this or they just made a guess. Based on the fact that they've been seeing 3B most of the time. But they're going to take advantage of the fact that their two-man setup on A is actually weaker than the two-man setup on A that they themselves were running. They're trying to exploit the hole in TSM's defense. This is very smart, and I think that what they do here works out very well. So they're going to push up short early. Uh, Crash is just going to get the intel off his camera. He's going to realize that Brimstone's pushed up. He's going to try and push him off this position, try and get this showers control. Little interaction here, Brimstone smoking showers. You get lots of utility coming out. Color nearly gets fried by that grenade. Stage wall goes up, and they now have control of the sights. Goodwill tries to get the bomb down. Rosa pushes him off, but goes for an awkward reload. Probably ran out of bullets. And Skadoodle takes advantage of it for the kill. Color refracts Brax. And this call for Brax here is brilliant. They rotate through the teleport, and then, oh, no, you guys thought we were going B. And eh, wrong. We wanted to res Braxton without falling back. Crash just gets the frag on the Cutler. They're going to push back through short and get the res. Braxton, with his huge throbbing brain, calls the fucking best strat humanly possible in this situation. They now have TSM on the back foot. Sight control, and they're about to get the bomb down for free. Crash is pushing up, creeping up towards the heaven area to get the intel. And then what happens here? This should be okay. At this point, 3v4, bomb down, match point, T1 should win this game. Let's see what happens. Wardell is gonna push forward. He's gonna try and get the look. He's gonna peek into U-Haul. Peek further into U-Haul. He's gonna see what's going on here. Boom! Collateral. Right here. This is, I think, just poor timing for T1. I think that Food was trying to push out from the Molotov into the cubby area next to Teleporter, and AZK was swinging for the peak, but they swung at the same time in a lineup for a collateral. This was the best possible outcome for TSM, and if this collateral doesn't happen, and even if this collateral happens, I think nine times out of 10, T1 still wins this round. But that gives us momentum. He hops up. He's feeling good. Wardell goes down. I think it's a little too aggressive there. Myth refrags Brax, but Brax trades him with the ult. So now it's 1v1. Drone is low health against an unknown health on Skadoodle. And then... Whoa, they actually did a weird cut here. What the fuck? They like cut back in time. So we get here the drone's perspective. He's 46 health. And right here, Skadoodle should win this fight. This comes down to a 1v1 where Skadoodle just misses. Drone gets the frag and they went around. They had no business winning. But the strat call from T1 here was brilliant. The short A push, Brax gets fragged, they take out Sabrosa on site, and they could plant, but they know that TSM are rotating hard, so they make the call to go through Teleporter and then hit him with another fake, an elaborate ruse, even more elaborate than the last, return back through short, res Brax, and get the bomb down at the same plant that they started with, but throwing TSM off pace at the same time by the fact that they've been lurking Crashy into Shower every single round. This was a brilliant strat. I think that T1 easily could have won this round, but it was just came down to a simple luck of positioning for Wardell to get that collateral and get the momentum advantage for TSM. 
just goes to show you that you can call the best strat possible and still lose the round. Alright, so here we are. We are a couple rounds past their original match point. TSM has done a good job of actually holding them at bay, forcing them into one eco round, kind of had to play around a little bit. Uh, T1 continued to struggle actually to close out rounds. They were closed a couple of times, but now 12-7 on the board. They're actually going to change up. They've been favoring the A positional pushes on their gun rounds, and we're going to see how this plays out. Once again, we're just going to take notice of player positions. We have Crashies once again playing this info lurk towards showers in the short A area. We have Drone and Sabrosa as the A site hold with Cutler, Myth, and Wardell playing B site duty. And the rest of the T1 players, three of them, AZK, Brax, and Skadoodle playing towards the hookah position with food backing them up towards long. Alright, let's see how this round plays out. Fuck, I fat fingered my goddamn mother... Hit my record button again, so let's make sure that I didn't fuck it up. It's your boy. Thank God for the power of editing. Yep, okay. Once again, fat hands. They destroy everything that I love. So here we go. We get a smash early from AZK to prevent the early peak from Hookah from Wardell. And they're going to be trying to take this hookah position control early. We see Brax already swung out. He's in kind of this hookah cubby area. And they're going to push up for the market door. They're going to try and push Color off. Color's going to get contact here. He's going to throw this lower, but he's going to hop off. He's actually going to play on the box outside of the hookah jump. That's the position he's going to favor throughout this round. It's a nice off angle if used sparingly, but can be kind of sussed out early. So as you can see, again, we're just going to go ahead and pause. What do we got right now? We have Crashies setting up all kinds of anti-flank material and just holding here. Again, Food is not pushed up long at all. He's just waiting for a long push to give his teammates room to establish hookah control. And the main vanguard of the team one attack is focused right here outside of hookah, ready to burst for the site. So, Elman throws a smoke towards A just to help out his teammates. Color has used his first slow, or both of his slows, into the hookah entrance. And now we play a waiting game. As you can see, AZK is going to go ahead and smash, get a little bit of control, excuse me. Bomb bot also used. And here is what T1 is trying to do. They are trying to use the Rolling Thunder from AZK to swamp the site. And normally, great idea. However, they wait so long that what happens here is we're going to see it here in a minute. Sabrosa is actually going to start rotating into a position where he can actually... We don't see where Sabrosa is actually when he pops this, but Sabrosa is supposedly right around here maybe. Or maybe he's rotated CT here, but either way he's able to Hellfire into Hookah to stop any B push from the opposite bomb site. And so they're waiting, they're waiting, ATK saying, hey, whenever you guys are ready, just say it, I'll do it, let's go, let's swamp it, crashes, it's rotated, they're ready, they're all in, and there it goes. Rolling Thunder goes out, Hellfire is returned, ATK is about to flash it, but they have to peel or else they're going to get Hellfired. So they quickly back up, Brax jumps out on the site to try and make a play happen, Brax gets traded out by Myth. And you think here, if you were in a standard matchmaking game and this happens to you, this round is over. But TSM, or T1, sorry. Sorry, my dog just walked by. Uh, T1 have the awareness to say, no, listen, we have the ultimates to clap back at this. As you can see on our pause frame here, Food is ready up his own counter hellfire for the middle of sight to flush them out. And what happens next is perfect. We have crashes coming out long. They counter Hellfire. They're in a stem pack. They push out. Food gets the first pick on the cutler. They flush them out of sight. AZK picks one. Food picks the other. AZK with another pick on the Wardell. We get the wall on the CT. They res Brax and just like that. Look at how fast this round turns around. From right here, Rolling Thunder gets essentially hard countered, right? They call the Rolling Thunder and then right here, boom. That Brunson ultimate would ruin most rounds. But T1 take a second. They reassess their situation. Brax goes out for the intel. He's like, no, 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 push this. Let's come in. Food with the counter ultimate. And just look how fast these picks go. Boom. Headshot on the cutler. Food jumps out. Sabrosa gets one. AZK gets Sabrosa. T1 get or Food gets myth. And then AZK gets the final kill in Wardell. Res on the Brax. 1v4. And then that's game over. Again, the the mid-ground calling and the patience from T1 throughout this game was exemplary. It was perfect. It was incredibly well executed. And even though they lost some of those mid-round calls, their play throughout this game 
was definitively better than TSM's. They played a better game, they used their utility better, and then they fragged better, and that's why they won. I thought it was really interesting to see what strats they use here on Bind. Bind is probably the best map in the game behind Ascent right now, and as such, lots of people are going to be playing it very often, and hopefully you guys found something that you can apply to your own game. So, with that being said, if you guys want to see me break down the other two maps from this Twitch Rivals Final, let me know. Leave me a comment. Leave me a like. Let me know on Reddit how you're feeling about this kind of content. I want to step in and start doing high-level analysis of what's going on in Valorant as we get further into the pro uh, circuit's life cycle, as well as even high-end ranked. And, um, you know, hopefully as the game gets more developed, we get a demo system I can do this kind of stuff more in depth and break down even bigger strats for you guys. So with that being said, I'm just going to take a moment. You guys can find me over at Twitter. That is linked down below. As well as my Twitch stream, twitch.tv slash lionhearts1337. I stream Valorant every single day. I take a day off every Monday. I haven't really ironed out a totally set stream schedule yet. But I'm playing Valorant after 5 o'clock most days. Uh, getting ready for ranked. Uh, I myself, it should be said, am not a high level player. I'm just someone who likes to analyze the game and make it easier for other people to understand. So when I stream, you're not going to get pro level uh, gameplay, but maybe you'll get some insight and you'll get to see someone who, I, at least I think, is very entertaining. So that being said, guys, uh, thank you guys for watching and hopefully you guys like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.